Hey, thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thanks for being here. As mentioned, I'm Sonia Shieso uh, from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And I'm going to be presenting work today that was uh, done in collaboration with Leah Zhang Kennedy from the University of Waterloo, and also Hala Asal of Jessica Rochlou, Riham Mohammed, and Khadija Bang, who are also from Carleton University. And so we're going to switch gear a little bit here, and we're going to talk about humans for a bit. So let's get started. Uh, in, at the end of 2016, uh, a large North American university experienced a significant ransomware attack. Now this happened at the end of the semester and just before the start of exams. And this is the story of what happened next. So uh, the ransomware infected Windows computers that were connected to the university network overnight. Uh, the exact details of the attack were never made public and can't be disclosed here. But um, the attack infected a whole lot of computers uh, belonging to research groups, most academic departments, and really all levels of university services. Now, the university described the incident as a network interruption. They uh, immediately and temporarily uh, shut down most of the university's services uh, to stop the spread of the infection. They did not pay the $38,000 ransom that was being asked. And the immediate recovery efforts uh, took several days, and the impact was felt for several weeks after uh, the infection. Now, this is clearly an unfortunate event, and I really don't wish it on any organization. Um, but as researchers, uh, this offered us a pretty unique opportunity to learn. Uh, so we wanted to understand the impact of the incident on end users in hopes of learning how organizations can better prepare and respond to such attacks. So we moved really quickly and we received IRB clearance to conduct two studies uh, with users. So we collected all of our data within six weeks of the initial infection um, before people started to forget their experience. So first we conducted an online survey and then we conducted in-person interviews uh, with affected students, staff, and faculty members. And as you can probably imagine, they had a lot to say. So let's have a look at what happened. So first, um, our anonymous online survey took about half an hour for people to complete, and they were not paid for filling out this survey. Uh, we advertised widely to everyone within the university community uh, using all channels available to us. And we got 150 responses. Uh, 90 females and 60 males across a really wide range of backgrounds throughout the university. And the questionnaire uh, covered their security practices before, during, and after the attack, uh, their reactions during the attack, their impressions of how the attack was managed, and any suggestions for improving the emergency protocols. We also conducted hour-long semi-structured interviews with 30 people. And here we asked about similar types of topics, um, but we wanted a chance to be able to dig deeper into the experiences to really understand the impact of the attack on their own, in their own words. So we recorded and we transcribed all of the interviews, and then we conducted qualitative analysis to understand the data. So for this talk, I'm going to combine the main results from both the survey and the interviews together. And there's a lot more details and nuances in the paper, so I encourage you to have a look if you're at all interested in the subject. And as we go through the results, I'll put up some quotes from some of the participants uh, on the screen. And it was kind of hard to narrow down which ones to show you. So again, if you're uh, interested, have a look in the paper. There's a lot more uh, in there. So we're going to go over the results uh, organized in four general themes. So we'll start with the more concrete uh, technological and productivity impacts of the attack. So the graph here uh, shows the survey responses uh, for the types of technology disruptions that they experienced. So for example, 56 out of 150 respondents said that their work computers was directly infected by the attack. Now, in general, though, uh, we see that most people suffered some kind of technology disruption um, during this incident. And these ranged from temporary loss of access and inconveniences uh, to really permanent data loss um, of, of their information. 
Now, most people said that they lost more than three days of productivity, and many of them said that they actually lost sort of several weeks uh, of work during this attack. And this is kind of difficult to quantify, though. Uh, for example, you know, we had students who were trying to study for exams, and all of their lectures were online. Or we had faculty and grad students uh, who missed paper submission deadlines. And, and so it's not exactly clear how this translates into days of productivity. Now, interestingly, uh, the emergency measures that were necessary to contain the infection caused as much disruption, if not more, than the actual infection itself. So for example, a lot of them lost their primary means of communication, both inter internally within the university and with the outside world. And they couldn't find alternatives because that information was on the systems that were currently offline to contain the attack. Uh, people talk about a mass exodus um, on the day of the attack because no one on campus could access digital resources, so the university staff was eventually all sent home, and the students left campus because there was really nothing they could do there. Now, those who had infected computers um, obviously felt the largest impact of this, and, and they describe a kind of helplessness and really some degree of horror at what was actually happening here. And so, for example, here we have a faculty member um, who was saving some of his data as so it was being synced on Dropbox. And he watched in horror as 15 years of work encrypted itself one file at a time. And he explains, you know, I realized this thing wasn't going to stop until it had done them all. And you can kind of sense this sort of helplessness here of like, I can't do anything and this is just happening in front of me. Uh, those with infected computers spent a lot of time trying to recover their data uh, from network backups, from external backups, from cloud services, from email attachments, and even copies from other people with varying degrees of success. Uh, one faculty member describes having to contact their book editor uh, for a copy of the textbook that they were currently writing. Uh, other ones describe having to redo a whole bunch of lost work that, they had origi that had originally taken them years to perfect. Now, moving on to the personal and social impact. So while this was an attack on an organization, it really had a significant personal impact on users. Uh, people in both the survey and the interviews had strong negative feelings. Uh, so the slide here shows the number of people in the survey who reported each of these emotions. And so among others, you see worry, you see anger, you see frustration, and you see a whole lot of fear happening. So in general, uh, people felt violated, right? Even in cases where the actual tangible damage was done to them was temporary or minimal, they felt like, hey, someone has invaded us. And we argue that the personal impacts are just as important uh, and as significant as the technological one, because at the end, you know, your organization is about the people. So some people even reported physical symptoms. So for example, this staff member had a doctor's appointment uh, at around the same time, and their blood pressure actually spiked from the stress of dealing with this attack and not knowing what was going to happen. Um, another impact that, we hadn't, uh, that hadn't initially occurred to us was uh, from the international students who were living in residence. Uh, and they were particularly stressed with the loss of connectivity because this is how they talked to their families back home and all of a sudden, their families were also worried because they couldn't reach the students. So for many of them, the internet is the only way for, for them to keep in touch with distant relatives, and all of a sudden, that was gone. So overall, uh, the attack caused resentment, and it damaged users' relationship with the university. And we found that a lot of the resentment came from a perceived lack of transparency about what had actually happened. So instead of feeling that the university community was working together to solve the problem, uh, people felt sidelined and, they, and kept in the dark, uh, even though they were the ones that were being directly affected by the attack. So let's move on to the risk perception and security practices. And so we can see from the graph here that most people were not worried about attacks before the incident. So they felt this was a very low risk kind of thing. There was a huge spike during the attack and then it came back down. 
Um, but it didn't go back to pre-attack levels, so some level of anxiety remained here. Now, interestingly, uh, the two resources that were not managed by the university, so the, their mobile devices and their personal computers, uh, were not really considered vulnerable at any point during this time. So people thought that the risk was directly related to the organization itself and not that there was this general increased risk uh, of them being attacked. And so perhaps because of this, 42% of the people in the survey said that the attack had zero impact on their security practices going forward. So these people thought that attacks just kind of happened and, and really they had no part to play in, in uh, protecting themselves against them. And the fourth theme that we saw related to communication. And, and here's where things really kind of went wrong. So most people found out about the attack uh, through word of mouth, through their personal social media, and through external news reports, and not through the official university channels. And when they could find the official communication, because remember, um, all of the online services were down, um, people thought that it didn't address their specific concerns, uh, it was confusing or vague, and it didn't help them to understand what they should be doing right now or what they should be doing in the future. When were they supposed to do certain things like turn on their computer or when could they get access to their email again? And they also wanted a whole lot more communication. So they wanted five status updates a day during the initial event. They wanted them twice a day for the days following and then once a week for the following weeks uh, until everything was settled again. A lot of people said that the main cause of frustration and stress wasn't the actual attack itself, but how the situation was communicated. People also wanted to know when life could return to normal. And I think this is best described um, by, by this participant here, who said, still to this day, to be honest, remember this is a few weeks on, uh, I don't feel like there was ever an end. There were notifications like, we're working on the situation, okay, you can connect again, but it was never like, it's over. And so it's all very much like it never really ended. But of course it did end. So now, a year and a half later, uh, what have we learned from this whole experience? So I'm going to go through six strategies that I think could be incorporated into uh, cyber response plans that actually acknowledge the role of your human users. The first one is share the plan. So your cyber response plan should be shared with the whole community before something happens. So explain what is expected of users during an incident, how and when the information is going to be shared, particularly if all regular digital communication channels are down. And we also suggest sharing a clear policy for what will happen in response to the attack. So for example, um, our, organiza our organization will never pay ransom because it makes us a bigger target in the future. Or we are going to erase and re-image any infected devices because we can't guarantee that they haven't been co otherwise compromised. Second, communication is key. So communication during and after the incident, uh, it needs to be frequent, it needs to be straightforward, and it needs to be upfront. There should be no hiding behind a network interruption. People also need to know from an official source that everything has been resolved. So kind of like when you have those weather forecasts and it says the weather warning has been lifted, this is what they wanted to know. Now, the ongoing communication um, should include specific advice for end users and describe any adjustments that have been made as a result of the incident. So have deadlines been extended? Uh, are there alternative ways that they should access their data at this point? What should they be doing? Third, give victims a voice. The people who were most affected by this incident wanted a voice in the recovery process. Now, they understand that you probably can't meet every request and some data loss is probably inevitable, but you should still recognize that 
there's real people who are impacted here, and this isn't just about the technology and the data. So in our study, many of the victims really just wanted an opportunity for a debrief. Right? They wanted to discuss their experience. They wanted to be heard. They wanted to have their insight and their suggestions taken into account. And, and really, you know, they might actually even surprise you with having something useful that, that might improve your plan. Four, practice user-centric security. Now, a common response to attacks is to tighten the security policy. And this might actually be a reasonable thing to do. Um, but security policies that are too restrictive, that are awkward, or that make unrealistic demands on users, like frequent password changes, are going to be bypassed by users. And this is going to happen intentionally so that users can accomplish their primary tasks, or it's going to happen by accident because they will inevitably make errors if your policy is too complicated. Now, updating the policy might actually be a reasonable thing, but the changes that you make have to be carefully weighed against their human cost. Are you actually helping the situation here, or are you just introducing uh, more ways that people are going to have to cope? Five, offer user-centric training. So cybersecurity training should be an ongoing service. And we even suggest that one-on-one -on -one consultations might be useful to help users set up their systems in a way that's both secure and meets their specific needs, uh, especially in diverse organizations like a university. So for example, we had one example of a faculty member who lost a whole bunch of research data because she felt that it was her responsibility to uh, protect and keep the privacy of this information, and she didn't want to put it up there uh, on the network where other people might access it. Um, but she didn't understand. She thought she was doing the safest thing, but of course, uh, as a result, lost a bunch of data. Uh, in general, though, uh, training material needs to explain the threats and how the security strategies actually address these threats. So users are more likely to comply if they understand that their actions are actually going to help in some way and they're not just some uh, dramatic overreaction. Six, provide user-centric data storage. A lot of people uh, didn't use network drives uh, where the data could have been restored relatively easily. And it might be tempting to dismiss this as the user's fault, right? They didn't follow the rules. Um, but often, users had legitimate reasons for this. So the official storage option didn't have the functionality they needed, it was difficult to use, or users misinterpreted what the safest option was. So storage and backup um, has to be straightforward, it has to be usable, and it has to have the needed functionality, like file sharing, like automatic backups, and like remote access. So to wrap up here, um, cyber attacks are disruptive and they're stressful regardless of when and where they happen. And most people recognize that attacks are sometimes going to happen despite your best efforts. But when they happen within an organization, though, users end up feeling like they have no control over the situation and everything is just happening to them. So from an, our, our analysis, uh, this caused a lot of extra strain and uh, negative impact on users. So planning and recovery have to address human factors uh, because otherwise, this negative impact of an attack is going to last far beyond the time that it takes for your technological uh, recovery. And that's it, so I'm happy to take any questions you might have.